Okay guys, I'm a little disappointed. I'm gonna say some rude things. <laughs> Evan Williams white label. Really? Really master of malt? See, when they first did this, they only had one master of malt calendar. And it felt like they put a lot of focus into every single one. Now they've got like, well, you know, 40. <laughs> and, and it feels like their base level whiskey one is sort of getting phoned in with the more popular names that just happen to be popular. Now, I get it. If you wanted an introduction to whiskey in general, this year's Master Malt Calendar would be brilliant. If you are new to whiskey and you are wanting to explore new regions or you'd only ever drink bourbon and you want to see what the rest of the world's like, or you'd only ever drink scotch and you want to see what the rest of the world's like, this is a decent intro so far. Day, what are we on? Day 12. This is a decent introduction to the world of whiskey of popular name brands and common flavor profiles with the exception of yesterday's Ailsa Bay. So, I get it, you know, but I really wanted to have some exciting, interesting new things. And I will tell you, I bought the more expensive whiskey one, the premium whiskey one, and that one is, hell yes. That premium one is what their original one was the last time I did this. I'm, if I do this again next year, I may change a different one. The bummer is, when you choose the more expensive ones, I eliminate a lot of you from being able to drink with me. But then a lot of you can't get the Master Malt calendar anyway, so maybe it's irrelevant. Um, okay, Evan Williams. Let me just first take a smell. It's just your traditional bourbon. I mean, the white label, if I'm not mistaken, the only major difference is that it's bottled at a higher proof than the black label. I mean, maybe there's something else, but I haven't been able to find it. Um, it's four to six years old. I'm just getting all the banana and typical cherry notes you get on a distillery out here. I will tell you though, it's raining outside my windows right here. And cold, and it makes sitting in here drinking whiskey even more fun. Um, it's the second highest, Evan Williams is the second highest bourbon brand selling in the world other than Jim Beam, that's pretty amazing. Heaven Hill, the Bernheim Distillery, right? Um, it's not expensive, man. This is a $15 bottle. You can see why I'm a little disappointed. One, I'm not a bourbon guy, and two. Now, here's the thing about Evan Williams. Let's well, take a sip first before I bitch about Evan Williams. It's fine. <laughs> That's the best I can say is it's a damn decent bourbon. I would never turn it down. It tastes fine. It's not remarkable. It tastes like every common budget line bourbon I've ever had with mild variations, maybe slightly more oaky and maybe slightly more maple syrup than some of the others. But it's thin tasting. There's a little bit of a bite on the back end from that 100 proof. That does make it more interesting than the Black Label. I mean, I'm having a hard time not sounding super like Eeyore right now. Good morning, if it is one, which I doubt. Um, okay, so as a bourbon, Evan Williams is great. Fine. I really like their single barrel a lot better. Uh, no surprise, I think they do a damn good job. There's a reason they're popular, it's because the bourbon tastes good. Um, but, let's talk about bourbon history, because people always do this. Especially bourbon distilleries and American whiskey distilleries, they love to talk about names and heritage instead of places, and I talked about this before. They love to pick some fancy name from history and attach themselves to the coattails of it. And Evan Williams is on their bottle, you know, since 1783. Kentucky's first distiller. Um, both of those things have been proven not true. <laughs> uh, they're not lies, so to speak, in as much as like it was not continuously in operation and it wasn't the same people or the same family um, and it's sort of a similar location, same location, but no one's totally certain. 
you know, but it was definitely not the first. I mean, there's no paper trail of any kind to show who was the first distiller in Kentucky. There's a lot of suppositions and ideas and guesses, but they all started around the late 1700s. Um, there were guys who were selling whiskey later who were there in the early 1770s. They could have been distilling early on. No one knows, right? No one knows. So the claim that you were the first, it's a little dubious, but, you know, welcome to marketing, I guess. Uh, and then the claim that he's been distilling since 1783. As a matter of fact, Michael Veach, uh, you should go get his book. He's got several. Um, and uh, writes a great blog. He actually did the research because he's a bourbon historian and he found paperwork showing that Evan Williams was actually on a boat in May of 1794 traveling from London to Philadelphia. Right? So Hey, I've been making whiskey in Kentucky since 1783, except I didn't make it to America until 1794. Whoops. <laughs> oh, man. But it doesn't stop them from saying it, and it doesn't stop them from putting up historical markers. I'm just saying, history books are an interesting thing. Um, there's a lot more information to show that there's... It could have been easily Jacob Myers and his brother, Samuel and Joseph Davis, or Jacob Myers. They were around at the same time. They could have been distilling much earlier. They both arrived in 1779, or the three of them. Anyway, I, I got no problem with Evan Williams. I think they're great. I think their fancy stuff is, I get it. Um... I just, I'm disappointed today, guys. Sorry. I'm having a hard time hiding it. It's an okay bourbon, but I would rather drink something else with you guys. So, till tomorrow, may your crazy stay this side illegal and may you return before we have time to miss you. Cheers.